St. John's East United Church of Christ, uh, where we connect people with Christ and with each other. Uh, certainly to those of you that are worshiping with us live here in the sanctuary, as well as those that may be joining us uh, via live stream, we are glad to be here. I was certainly glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Uh, Jesus Christ said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let us begin our worship as we do each and every Sunday uh, by acknowledging the fact that God is good and absolutely positively all the time. Amen. So in honor of Memorial Day tomorrow, I will play the Armed Forces um, a medley. And if you'd like to stand up if you were in those, um, it's the Army, the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force, the Coast Guard. I'll leave off the Space Force because I don't think any of you were in that, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Excellent job as always, Henry. Is there anything Henry cannot play? Man, I tell you what. Uh, but that is beautiful, and man, we certainly do. And I was going to mention it later, but since he just played the music, and I saw a couple of brothers standing up to all of our men and women, uh, whether you are a veteran, whether you are currently serving, we, uh, we certainly thank you uh, for your service. Let's pray, God. We are certainly grateful, thankful, and appreciative of this, another expression of your love, your grace, and your mercy. Um, as we take a retrospective look back, God, over this past week, one thing that can be said without any sense of contradiction, you have been with us every step of the way. God, we thank you for every good and perfect gift. We realize that they all come from you. Uh, we thank you for protecting us from danger seen and unseen, for giving us a reasonable portion of health and strength, uh, for providing for us, God, both uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, and even spiritually. Um, thank you, God, for a church that we can come and worship and fellowship and commingle our voices together and uh, worship you in spirit and in truth. God, the list of gratitude that we have this morning is way too long uh, for us to express, but we don't uh, ever want you to think that we take your blessings for granted. Now, God, we ask your blessings upon this worship experience today. Bless every individual, every family that is represented here, uh, those that are worshiping with us via live stream. And then, God, as we bring the word of God today, we, uh, we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will speak to me as I speak to the people. And that, God, when this service has come to an end, that we will leave here better than whence we came, better disciples for thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship this morning. Loving God, you call us to turn away from our own selfish interests. We come before you this morning with open hearts and open hands. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, move within us and among us as we worship. Open our ears to your call. Send us back out into the world to live and work as your faithful disciples.
Amen. We uh, now, as we do each and every week, uh, like to acknowledge our prayer requests and praise reports. Uh, before we do, I uh, have a presentation I would like to make briefly. If I could have my friend and agent, Gwen Lewis, please stand. As many of you may be aware, we just finished um, 11 weeks of Bible study on Wednesdays at 6 o'clock. Uh, we are taking um, a break. We're taking a break for, uh, for the summer. Um, and first of all, I just want to thank Gwen for going through and setting up the Zoom and all of that. Secondly, want to thank, uh, as I see several of you who have been regular uh, attendees, and I appreciate your support, your dialogue, and your input. But the reason why I asked Gwen to stand, and thank you, Kathy, for giving me this kind of award. I kind of fixed it up. We had one, and if I'm wrong on this, let me know, because I do have other awards. But we have one perfect attendee that made every Bible study every Wednesday at 6 o'clock. And so this says to Sister Gwen Lewis, the St. John's East United Church of Christ Wednesday Bible study, perfect attendance award, spring 2021. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we, uh, we have certainly had a, a good time uh, for almost like three months, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to when we come back. I do want to apologize to our Wednesday 6 p.m. group. Uh, I forgot to bring an outline, so I'll have it on the table next week. Uh, rather than just taking off for the whole summer and not doing anything, um, I gave out a homework assignment, so I'll go ahead and verbally articulate that uh, this morning. Uh, for the month of June, uh, your assignment is to read the book of Psalms. Uh, the, uh, the month of July, uh, the book of Proverbs and uh, the month of August, the book of Romans. So I'm gonna have you an outline um, here at church uh, next Sunday, because somebody I already know, man, I ain't gonna read 150 chapters of Psalms. So I've, I've got you 17 of Brother Herring's select divisions of Psalms. So if you wanna take the shortcut, uh, I'm, uh, I'll have that for you next week. But this way, it'll kind of keep us connected, keep us plugged in, uh, keep us reading and studying. Um, now going to our prayer requests and uh, praise uh, reports. We are praying for uh, the family of Sister Rita Cooksey. She is a longtime member of Nazarene Baptist Church here in Evansville. Her mother recently passed away uh, earlier this week. So we're lifting up that family. This is actually a prayer request, ongoing prayer request, as well as a praise report. Another member over at Nazarene, Lynn Farmer, and her son after, I believe it was North's gradu graduation this week, was in a, a really tough uh, car accident. Initially didn't know if Sister Farmer was going to survive, but she's had a couple of surgeries already. Um, got a note from her husband, Deacon Charles Farmer on Facebook. She is improving, she's doing better, as well as the son. So we're just thanking God for his uh, protective mercies. Uh, of course, we've already mentioned um, how we are honoring our, our veterans and those that are currently serving all the men and women. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your service. Uh, and we're also recognizing uh, our graduates on uh, whatever level, grade school, middle school, high school, college. Uh, at our eight o'clock worship uh, over at Memorial, we recognized uh, several uh, that had graduated. One in particular was uh, a longtime friend of mine, Deacon Alexia McAllister. And uh, when she stood up uh, today, what Pastor Brooks does, he has everybody come to the podium and tell what their future plans are. And um, uh, Deacon Alexia shared uh, how she, uh, at age 18, um, had, had, a, had, had, a, had had a baby and many didn't think you know, she'd even complete high school. She went on uh, not only to get her bachelor's, but uh, just received her, uh, her MBA. And uh, that's an inspiration as well as a role model of what can be done. So again, to all of our graduates, we're so very proud of you. Uh, Deborah, you just had a, was it a granddaughter? Is it Anna Marie, uh, just graduated from North? 
congratulations. I know uh, I wasn't able to make the drive by yesterday, but certainly congratulations. And Pat, we have a great granddaughter that will be graduating from Joshua Academy. So uh, we're, we're excited and uh, she's looking forward to kindergarten. Wow, man, getting ready to turn the big 5-0. So we, uh, we are appreciative of progress. Yes, ma'am, Kitsy. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Okay. Congratulations. All right. Thank you so much for sharing. Any other prayer requests or praise reports? Okay. Yes. Yes. Wow. Pat's, uh, you probably couldn't hear that in the back, pa uh, Pat's nephew, uh, Raymond Morris Jr., who just a few, minute, a few months ago, his father passed away, his son just recently passed away, and so they're making arrangements. So let's uh, please keep Pat and Raymond and his entire family uh, lifted in our prayers. Yes, Christy. My daughter, Mallory. Daughter Mallory, okay. Okay, we can do that. Yes, Steve. Uh, they traveled for everyone who went places and coming back. Yes, yes. Um, thank you for that reminder. A lot of people uh, travel during the holidays, and now with things kind of opening up with uh, COVID, more people are traveling. So uh, safe travel. Um, um, my brother Steve uh, treated myself and Cliff uh, to brunch yesterday over at the carousel. Then we went over to Arc Lanes shot a little pool and surprisingly our baby brother Mike from Indianapolis uh, showed up. We didn't know he was coming and we found out after the fact he and his wife got a new car and they wanted to put it on the road or whatever so but they came in and it's just nice to uh, be able to fellowship with family especially uh, with what has transpired over the last few months and we have not been able to come together many times. So uh, we're, we're grateful and thankful for those opportunities. God, um, you're a good God, kind God, a gracious God, a patient, understanding God, a forgiving God. And God, we, uh, we give your name, praise, honor, and glory. Uh, God, we understand that um, whatever struggles, problems, negative situations and circumstances that we may be currently experiencing, we still give you thanks because the Bible uh, encourages us uh, not for everything, but it does say in everything to give thanks. We give thanks, God, because one, we realize whatever we're dealing with, it could be worse. As a matter of fact, I want everyone to think this morning as you are praying along with me, that whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, someone wishes that they were in your shoes. And so God, we, uh, we thank you because you have promised us that you would be with us. Uh, you've promised us that you would never put more on us than we can bear. And then you promised God you would be with us always. So uh, we're going to continue to put our faith, our hope and our trust in you because we do acknowledge and re-acknowledge the fact that you are in control. God, you heard the names um, that came across the list this morning. Um, even though we may not, uh, not, uh, not know all the specific details, uh, because you're an omniscient God, you do know those details. So right now, in the name of Jesus and in the power of his shed blood, uh, we pray favor, healing, blessing, restoration, to each and every one as they go through, as we continue to put our faith, our hope, our trust in you. Now bless us, God, as we go through the remainder of this service, and we thank you, we praise you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If we could um, pray the Lord's Prayer um, together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and
Amen. Y'all did good. And again, uh, for those of you who may have just came in, welcome. We're certainly glad to see everybody out on such a beautiful uh, Sunday morning. Um, I, uh, of course, like to do shout outs. I uh, want to thank our uh, church secretary, uh, Linta Wonder Woman Carter, uh, again, for another uh, beautiful uh, bulletin cover. Um, and if you probably, if you haven't noticed, it actually reads, Live in Such a Way that those who know you but don't know God will come to know God because they know you. So uh, very appropriate. Thank you, Linta. Uh, got our, uh, our uh, newsletter uh, in the mail this week. And so uh, please take a look at that, look for updates, so forth as well. Uh, if we could, um, uh, we're gonna turn to the New Testament chapter 16. Gospel according to St. Matthew's chapter 16. And as you are turning or looking in your electronic uh, device, repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I am a believer, not a doubter. And my life is the better after having heard the word of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Matthew chapter 16. Let's go down and start our reading at verse 24. Matthew 16 verse 24. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Verse 26, for what is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Uh, with that reading, we would like to speak for a few minutes this morning on the subject of live your faith. We want to not just talk about faith, but we actually want to put our faith in action. We want to live our faith. 
Uh, if we could, uh, let's start with a biblical definition of the word faith. Many of you are familiar with it. It comes from what we commonly know as the faith chapter. Um, that is the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. That very first verse says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's also the evidence of things not seen. Uh, a few other faith-related verses, the just shall live by faith and not by sight. Uh, one that you hear me recite each and every Sunday, so then, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If we stay in Hebrews chapter 11 and actually look there at verse 6, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him or to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I would ask us briefly this morning to take a, a quick look at some of the individuals in scripture that please God. That Hebrews 11, 6 says, if you want to please God, you must believe that he is, and then you must fervently or specifically, it says, diligently seek him. You're, you're really focused. You're, you're making an intentional effort. Uh, let's look at a few characters in the Bible. Most of these should be familiar to you. How about our friend Abel, uh, the son of Adam and Eve? Uh, Abel was a good brother, um, and he was faithful in his stewardship because he didn't just give to God, but when he gave to God, he gave God his best. As we look at that particular text cl even closer, we sadly see the first murder in the Bible, which actually... Uh, was uh, caused by Abel's brother Cain because of envy and jealousy. But even as you look closer at that, Cain did not give his best, but got jealous of Abel because he did. The point I want to make here, we as modern day believers, modern day disciples, uh, we want to be good stewards. Uh, stewards of our time, our talent, our treasure, but we don't just want to give a mediocre effort. We want to be like Abel and we want to give our best. How about in the Old Testament, our friend Noah, who faithfully trusted in God in the midst of criticism, in the midst of ridicule, uh, he obeys God and builds this huge boat that we now know as the ark, even though at that particular time it had never rained. No one had ever seen or experienced rain. And the point we'd like to make here is there will be times that God will call you, call me, call us to do something that others consider strange, unusual, out of the ordinary, out of the norm, and you're gonna to have to make a decision. Am I going to faithfully trust God, obey God, or will I wilt under the pressure? Uh, pressure in this instance, we're gonna call it peer pressure. And most of the times when you hear that word peer pressure, you're talking about kids and teenagers and running with the wrong crowd and being influenced by their friends, but it's not restricted just to young people. Peer pressure occurs to adults as well. And Noah was in a tough situation. As a matter of fact, uh, I sometimes refer to him as Reverend or Pastor Noah because he preached one, ser uh, one sermon and one topic for 120 years. Y'all know uh, the title of his message, It's Going to Rain. And he preached that sermon not only for 120 years, but if he wasn't a committed individual, he would have gotten very uh, discouraged, distressed, and depressed because in that whole 120 year of preaching while he was building the ark, he didn't get one convert. The only people we now understand as we study and read the scriptures were Noah's wife, 
Noah's three sons and their wives were the only ones that responded. There's a message uh, there as well. When we are committed to doing what God is calling us to do, even when the crowd is not responding, we remain faithful. Why? Because God, uh, nowhere in the scripture, calls us to be successful, but several times in the scripture, even as we're studying this morning, he does call us to be faithful. So even when you're not seeing or getting the response, even when you're not seeing the results, even when the numbers aren't what you or I think they ought to be, we remain in faith, we remain trusting, we remain obedient to God. Here's one of my favorites, Brother Enoch. Enoch walked so faithfully with God that he did not experience physical death. As a matter of fact, when you read the scripture in Genesis, it actually says that he walked so close with God that God took him. I actually heard one preacher give this particular illustration that Enoch, in walking with God, he had walked so long, so close, so faithful, that if you will, God said to him, you are now closer to my house than you are to your house, and he took him on in to heaven. That's a lesson for us to learn today, is that we want to stay close to God, and I'll be the first to tell you, that's not always easy, especially in the society we find ourselves in now, because so many people now are either ignoring God, they're saying they don't believe in God, they don't trust God, they believe that God and prayer and Jesus and Holy Spirit and church and worship, it's, it's old and foggy and nobody Nobody's doing that anymore. Well, I come to tell you, there's going to be a time where every man, woman, boy and girl is going to have to stand before God and give an account of their stewardship. And they're going to wish that they did have that relationship. They're going to wish that they were faithful. They're going to wish that they were close. So the Bible reminds us, don't become weary. Don't get tired on well-doing. Uh, because we will reap if we what? If we don't quit or uh, Old Testament says if we faint not. Uh, one more and y'all heard me talk about him before but man I, I, I can't I, I just can't get away from Job. Job since we're talking about being faithful uh, since we're talking about living our faith, Job becomes a great example because we know the story. He loses all of his physical possessions. He loses all 10 children. He loses his health. He loses his friends. And yes, his wife even turned on him. But Job stayed the course. Job gives a number of lines that help me and hopefully it helps you as we go through this life and sometimes struggle, sometimes doubt, sometimes get stressed out. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Sometimes even get depressed. Job says that as he lost everything, physical uh, possession, material things that many of us think are so important. Job simply said this naked. I came into the world and naked I will leave here. Job, while his friends were criticizing him, while his wife was saying, look, man, this thing is not working. You, you just need to curse God and go ahead and die. Here was Job's response. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And then, of course, one of my all time favorite lines in all my appointed time. I'm going to what? I'm going to look at my calendar. I'm going to look at my watch and I'm going to wait until my change comes. Change will come if you will hold out. Uh, Pat, I wish I could remember the name of the group up in Indianapolis. It might have been the Pentecostal Ambassadors, sung a song back in probably the 70s, early 80s. Uh, if I can hold out, if I can keep the faith, God is going to come and see about me after a while. I'm going to stay in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, taking a look at verse 13 
all these individuals, and I don't have time to read it, so uh, later today, later this afternoon, later this week, read that entire 11th chapter of Hebrews. Uh, again, we call it the faith chapter, and you'll see some of the individuals that I've mentioned here. You'll see others as well, but then check out verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims here on earth. In other words, every now and then, even as you stay in faith, you won't always see the end result. But that doesn't mean that you give up or you quit having faith. That's why when you look at verse 1 that says, now faith is the substance of what? Things I'm hoping for. But it's the evidence of things, if I can take my glasses off, of things not seen. I have not seen the manifestation. I have not seen the tangible evidence, but I'm still staying focused. If we as modern day disciples, followers of Christ, are going to truly live our faith, we need to understand that God is always looking for men and women, teenagers, boys and girls uh, that are wanting to work or serve uh, in furthering his ministry. In other words, God is not just looking for us to say verbally that we have faith and to say that we believe him, but he's also looking for us to do something. God is looking for us to uh, put it into action. Uh, if we could, and I'm going to go ahead and turn, and if you'd like, you can, or you can just listen and follow along. Let's go to the book of James, and let's look at a few verses in chapter 2. James chapter 2. And I'm going to start uh, at verse 14, and we want to subtitle this Faith Without Works. I, I just pointed out, it's one thing to say you have faith. It's another thing to put some tangible evidence or some effort or some shoe leather or some elbow grease. Y'all understand what I'm trying to say? Some work behind what I say that I have faith in. Uh, let's start at verse 14. What does it, does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? And then look at the illustration he gives. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and then one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not the things which are needful to the body. What does it profit? And I do realize that's King James, but here's the breakdown. You see somebody that you know is hungry. You see somebody that it's obvious that their attire is not what it ought to be. Uh, it's the winter time and they don't have a hat or they don't have a coat or they don't have gloves. And uh, uh, many of us so-called super saints will look at them and say, I'm praying for you. Go in peace. Well, he or she is still what? They're still shivering in the cold. He or she's stomach is still growling because they are hungry. And God has blessed you, put you in a position where you can bless them. And for whatever reason, you choose not to. That is not putting faith in action. Verse 17, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say thou hast faith. And I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. But check this out, man, this is right there in verse 19. You do well, the devils also believe and tremble. So think about something. We're not the only ones that believe in the existence of God. Devils, Satan, Lucifer, they believe and understand in the existence of God as well. Verse 20, but will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? And man, we know 
uh, when we look at Abraham, that he was a man of faith. But he didn't just talk a good game. When the chips were down, so to speak, he put his faith what? He put his faith in action. Uh, after going all of those years and not being able to have a child and God blesses him with a son Isaac in his old age and then shortly after he blesses him, he asks him to give that son back to God in the form of a sacrifice. Many of y'all know the story. They prepare to go up on the mountain to worship. And y'all remember what Abraham's son said to him? Father, I see uh, the wood. Father, I see the fire. Where is the what? Where is the sacrifice? And Abraham, being a man of faith, even though he couldn't see how that situation was going to work out, you know what he said to his son? Man, it's a beautiful thing. He said, the Lord will provide. Didn't see it, didn't understand it, couldn't intellectually figure it out in his mind, but his faith told him that God would provide. So on their way up the mountain, they get to the top and still know what? No evidence of the sacrifice. What does Abraham do? Abraham binds his son, blindfolds his son, lays Isaac on the altar, raises up the knife to sacrifice. And it was at that point that God, through an angel, said, stay your hand. Look over there. There is a what? There is a ram in the bush. And that's why we that's where we get the term Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. I need somebody to understand this morning. Right when you're at the breaking point, right when you can't see how this thing is going to work out, God will provide. If you will stay in faith, he will provide that ram in the bush. Verse 22, seeth thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. In other words, not just talking it, but actually putting it into action. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled with saying, Abraham believed God and it was imputed into him for righteousness, for he was called a friend of God. So we want to remain in faith even when we can't see tangible results. Now, having said that, I've got a warning for all of us that are wanting to continue to grow in grace, knowledge, and stature, and we're genuinely serious uh, about um, growing in our relationship with God. Here's the warning. Satan, the devil, is going to test your faith. And there's a couple of ways that uh, he will look to do that. Uh, one is to cause uh, doubt uh, and for you to become discouraged. Uh, now, not when, but uh, not if, excuse me, but when that happens, remember a few things. Number one, the Bible reminds us that it rains on the just and the unjust. Bad, negative, so-called unfair, hurtful, uncomfortable things don't just happen to sinners. It doesn't just happen to people that don't go to church. It doesn't just happen to the atheist or the agnostic. It happens to save people as well. But see, that's why we want to not only stay in faith, but one of the ways we stay in faith is staying in the word. What does the word tell us in Romans 8, 28? And we know that all things work together for the good of, of those that love God and who are the called according uh, to his purpose. There will be times like he did for Job, that God will temporarily allow you, allow me, allow us to lose things that are important to us. But remember, when that deal with Job, the devil had to get permission from God to put him through all of those trials and tribulations. In other words, everything, and, and somebody needs to hear this this morning, Everything that happens to us falls under the umbrella of what we call God's permissive will. Nothing happens to any of us that God is not aware of and that he allows or permits to happen. And when those things happen, understand one of the fundamental promises of God. 
that he will never put more on us than we can bear. Or let me say it like this, if he brings us to it, he will certainly bring us through it. As a child of the king that is living their faith, remind yourself that greater is he that is in you, that's the Holy Spirit, is greater than he that is in the world. My faith is being tested. My faith is being tested. My faith is being tested. First Peter chapter one, verse seven, that the trial or the test of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In that same chapter one, verse nine, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So. We gather from that verse, since God has saved us, he is also helping us to deal with and enabling us to handle any test, any trial, any problem, any negative situation. So the question now becomes, what should we be doing as we are in this living our faith process? You and I should be in the ongoing process of getting to know God better, or uh, like our friend Enoch, to walk closer with God. Brother John, how do we do that? Uh, we do that with an active prayer life, including spending a certain amount of quiet time with the Lord, spending time in the Word of God, and not just uh, corporately when we do a Wednesday uh, Bible study via Zoom at 6 o'clock, but also you spending some personal time in the word. That's one of the reasons I gave out that homework assignment. Even though we may not be coming together over the next eight to 10 to 12 weeks on Wednesdays, I would recommend, since you're already in the habit, some of y'all of doing it, how about having your own Wednesday Bible study based on the assignment that Brother John uh, has given you. Every now and then, Brother John might just call some of you on the phone and check to see what you've been reading. One of the things I appreciate about my friends here at St. John's, they are not hesitant uh, to ask a question or reach out. Uh, isn't that right, Steve? How are you doing? That's right. She meant last Sunday. Uh, I got up here and did some kind of quote talking about uh, uh, when people get in a tight situation, sometimes uh, they go to their uh, bottle, which is alcohol. Sometimes they go to their blunt, uh, which is marijuana or weed or grass. Y'all know what that is. Okay. But see, the last one I said, uh, sometimes they go to their boot. And so I'm sitting up watching a basketball game last Sunday, and I get a text from Steve. And you know, Steve, you know what the text said? And it threw me for a loop. He, he said, what is the third B? And I said, what is the third B? And I, man, I, and so I, I actually, I had my notes right there in front of me on the table. And I started flipping through, and then it hit me. Uh, bottle, blunt, boo. And so I called Steve on the phone. We, we worked out the details. So yo, boo is your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your significant other, anybody that you might go to when you're in a tight or negative situation that you go to for comfort or support, which is not always a bad thing, especially if you got a spiritual boo that'll pray with you or read scripture with you or give you a word of encouragement. Unfortunately, for so many people, that is not the case. But I appreciate, number one, it lets me know people are listening to the message. It also lets me know people are taking notes and it lets me know that people are meditating on the word even after the benediction. So Steve, I, I, I definitely appreciate you. So what else should we be doing? Active prayer life, spending time in the word of God, what we're doing today, regular church attendance, fellowshipping with like-minded believers, last but not least, witnessing and sharing your faith with others. See, as you live your faith, Part of that is not just being a good role model or a good example, and that's a good thing, but look for opportunities to share what it is that God has done for you, how God has blessed you. Look to share that with others that you and I come into contact with. As we continue to do these things on a consistent basis, you will begin to experience a change, and I like to say it like this, from the inside out. We will become more spiritual minded versus being more secular minded. Our focus changes. Our attitudes change. 
our priorities change. We become stronger spiritually. Things that used to bother us and used to upset us don't do so anymore or they don't do so uh, as often. We become more fruitful. We become more productive. We become more, man, I like this, useful to God. This will also include learning to love others more and to love others more deeply. This also includes loving, caring about, and having a heart for those that don't know the Lord, that don't know Christ. Uh, as I prayerfully observe the modern day church, and I'm not just talking about St. John's, but I'm talking about uh, the church at large. The modern day church of 2021, one of the biggest disappointments I see is we many times struggle with keeping what I call the main thing, the main thing. And Brother John, uh, what are you talking about when you say the main thing? I'm so glad that you asked that question. The main thing when you study the scripture is getting others saved, getting others in right relationship with God and making disciples. Where'd you get that from, Brother John? I found that in what we call the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20. Go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing men in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Now, we do a lot of good things, both inside the church and outside of the church, and we should do those things. But those things should never supersede or be more important, or be a bigger priority than bringing others into a relationship with Jesus Christ. One of the scriptures I read as I was going through our text this morning was the question, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? A few months ago, I preached a message here at St. John's entitled, The Three C's of Spiritual Success. Many of y'all remember what they were. The uh, first C was commitment. The second C was consistency. And the third C was change. If we're going to truly live our faith, it is imperative that we start making some changes. When you look in the book of Romans, one of our assignments for Bible study during the summer, if you go to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it reads something like this. I beseech ye, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's verse 1. But verse 2 is really where I want to go. And be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the what? By the renewing of your mind. Many people right now, both in and out of the church, you know what they need. They need a transformation. They need a change of heart, a change of attitude, a change of outlook, a change of perspective. Let me run through these very quickly. We first need to have a change of mind about God. Man by nature, and some of y'all won't shout on this, but it's still true. Man by nature is a spiritual rebel and a religious outlaw constantly going away from God, doing his or her own thing. How many of y'all remember the Isley Brothers? Come on, somebody. Yeah, It's your thing. Do what you want to do. Well, the fact is, it's not your thing. And you can't always do what you want to do, not if you're in right relationship with God. Uh, y'all remember our friend Noah. God gave uh, Reverend Noah a specific preaching assignment to go and preach salvation to the Ninevites. You know what the problem was? Noah couldn't stand the Ninevites. Matter of fact, he hated the Ninevites. And instead of being obedient to God, y'all know the rest of the story, he got on that boat and went the opposite direction. Well, isn't it amazing how God ultimately will still work that thing out? Noah gets on a boat, Storm comes up, 
man, they start throwing stuff overboard because they was afraid the ship was going to sink. And I don't know if I got any gamblers in here. I don't know if I got anybody that goes to the casino. But them sailors drew lots on that boat. And man, when they drew lots, guess whose name came up? Man, Jonah's Noah. Uh, Jonah's name came up and they threw that brother overboard. Y'all know how it worked out. Thrown overboard, swallowed by a fish in the ship's belly, uh, in the fish's belly for three days and three nights. And this is the only place you'll see this in scripture. At the end of the three days, the fish vomited. Man, that's nasty. He vomited Noah up on dry land. Guess what? Noah decided then, I think I better go ahead and preach to these Ninevites. God will work this thing out even when we are intentionally going the wrong way. Man does not want God to rule over him. Y'all know what the deal is. Man wants to be his own God. And when he can't be his own God, then he wants to tell God what type of God he wants him to be. See, a lot of people out here, and again, Pat, they ain't going to shout on this either. We want a Santa Claus God. Uh -huh. We want a God that we can make a list and check it once and check it twice and then tell God what it is that we want. We, uh, we can give a list of things and expect God to give us everything we want and everything we desire. But the God that many men want is not the God that we find in the scriptures. The God in the scripture is a sovereign God. He's a predestinating God. He is a God that is holy, who infringes on man's freedoms. He's a, a God that reveals his wrath on all ungodliness and unrighteousness and who will one day judge all mankind. And when we see God for who he really is, it will cause us to make a change. It will cause us to say we're sorry. It'll cause us to repent, to have a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of attitude. Repentance means man must lay down his arms of rebellion. He must stop saying no to God and say yes to his will, his way, his word. He must stop calling God a lie and acknowledge that God is right and bow before him in humble submission. The Bible teaches us in the book of Romans, there is none righteous, no, not one, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So after we've had a change of mind about God, then we must have a change of mind about ourselves. You can't change your mind about God without having a realistic change of mind about yourself. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, the temptation, Adam and Eve. Y'all know the offer that Satan proposed to Adam and Eve. Ye shall be as gods. And when you look at it, the essence of sin is it seeks to dethrone God as the creator. We want to be our own God. Man. He's, a self he's on a self-sufficient ego trip and, the, and thinks of things uh, of himself more highly than he ought to. It's all about me, myself, and I. Uh, just, just look at some of the characteristics that uh, man exhibits. Self-centeredness, conceit, indulgence, pleasure-seeking, sufficiency consciousness, self-righteousness, but if I'm going to truly live my faith, I have to see myself. I got to look in the mirror of God's word and see myself as the wretch that I am. And when I see who I really am, I realize that I'm a sinner that needs God's grace. And after I've had a change of mind about God, change of mind about myself, lastly, I must have a change of mind about Jesus Christ. Many in the world today will tell you that Jesus is simply a, a great teacher or he's a founder of a great religion, but he's much, much more. We must look at Jesus as prophet, to be taught by him, to receive his every word. He has the answers to our questions. Jesus has the solutions to our problems. He is our light in this dark world. But we must also look at Jesus as priest, to be saved as well as to be kept by him. He offered himself over 2,000 years ago as a sacrifice for us. It was Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And here's some more good news. Jesus not only saves, but he keeps us. There are still people that 
preach and teach that you can lose your salvation. The Bible tells us that once you are in right relationship with God, you cannot be plucked out of his hand. The question is asked, what shall separate us from the love of God? And it goes down the list, pearl and sword and all those other things. But then it ends by saying nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Understand that our salvation is not based on anything we've done other than the fact that we accept the free gift of salvation. We are now acceptable to God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and he is our only hope for salvation. Last but not least, we must see Jesus as king, to be governed by him. As a result of the finished work on Calvary, Jesus is no longer the meek and lowly Jesus we recognize in the month of December uh, every year all over the world during the holiday season. And do y'all notice, some of y'all saw it this last Christmas holiday season. All kind of people were celebrating, saved and unsaved, churched and unchurched. Many of them even sing the Christmas songs but have never encountered or had a personal relationship with the Jesus that they're singing about. And again, I repeat, he's no longer that meek and lowly baby in a manger. Jesus now is king. Today, on May the 30th, 2021, 11.32 a.m. Central Standard Time, he is sitting at the right-hand side of the Father as I speak making intercession for each and every one of us. As a result of the finished work on Calvary, God has exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. I'll close it out like this, that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, do you really want to live your faith, here's the bottom line. You must believe in Jesus Christ. You must be willing to commit your life to him and to trust him as both Lord and Savior. I've got a question this morning. It was one that was asked of me uh, 50, 53 years ago now. Brother John, are you willing to trust him? Are you willing to commit your life to him? And as I uh, close this message this morning, let me give you a, a real life example of what sometimes can happen, even in the church, even when the motivation and the intent is good, but the bottom line result is not. She is, uh, she's gone home to be with the Lord now. Pat, you'll remember Mother uh, Beatrice Irvin. Mother Irvin was one of my Sunday school teachers when I was a young child. And uh, I appreciated her loyalty, her, her commitment to God, her commitment to the church. And what we would do after 930 church school, we would all, all the Sunday school classes would come together and we would do a brief review, don't ask me to spell this word, uh, someone would catechize the lesson. In other words, they would take two to three minutes and summarize everything everybody had studied, whether it was a youth, teenager, or adult class, we'd all come together and hit some of the key points of that 930 Sunday school lesson. And then at the end of Sunday school, there would always be an invitation to discipleship. Here's what happens, and I was probably about eight at the time. When the invitation was given, there's some chairs up, Mother Irvin leaned over to me and said, John, uh, have you joined the church yet? And of course, I had been taught by my parents, uh, no, ma'am. Uh, then she said, then you need to go on up there. Okay. Well, here was, here was the good news, bad news. The good news is Mother Irvin wanted me to be in right relationship with God. She wanted me to get baptized. She wanted me to join the church. The problem was, as I've been talking about this morning, there had been no what? There had been no change on the inside. Now, because I was an obedient child, I went up to the front, I took the chair, I went through the motions, but guess what happened later that day when I told my mama 
that I had joined the church. What did Helen Herring say? You ain't joined nothing because you haven't made a verbal, com a verbal confession and commitment of a relationship with Christ. I'm telling that story because I believe even as I share this message this morning and somebody's listening to me live stream, somebody, even though the intent was good, you went through the motions just to be uh, in the church. You wanted to be a member. Uh, uh, you wanted to be where you thought was the right place to be. But you never want to simply go through the motions with something that is as important as your eternal salvation. Do y'all realize one of the saddest times in human history will be, according to the book of Matthew, you can read it later when you get home, is when people stand before God to give an account of their stewardship and God will look at them and say, depart from me, I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. That's why I always spend a little time at the end of every message to give people an opportunity to say what we many times call the sinner's prayer. Uh, God, I realize that I'm not in right relationship with you. I realize I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. I need to be in right relationship with you. I'm ready to commit my life to you. Now, nowhere in that prayer does it say all of a sudden, abracadabra, poof, you're going to be perfect, that you're not going to have any issues, you're not going to have any challenges. But what it does say, now in right relationship with God, and now with the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you can now live a life, live your faith in a way that is pleasing to God. And the icing on the cake is this. And y'all know I'm not lying when I say it. This life that we're living right now is temporary. I know y'all enjoying it. Steve already told us. We're praying for safe travel. As people are vacationing, man, they flying. Pat's going to L.A. here in a couple of weeks. Man, enjoy it while you can because it's what? It's temporary. But understand that eternity is a long, long time. Eternity is forever. Let's make sure we're in right relationship with God. And for those of us that are already in right relationship, let us continue to live our faith. At this time, uh, we appreciate uh, your presence today, appreciate uh, uh, your, uh, your prayers and your encouragement. Uh, I didn't think I was gonna see my friend, uh, Sam and Christy, saw, uh, saw Sam Tuesday night at chess. He said he's gonna be out of town and bless his heart, he, he came up this morning, he said, John, he said, uh, my mind don't, don't function as smooth as it used to. I got my days mixed up. He said, I'm actually going out of town next week. You know what I told Sam? I said, man, I'm just glad you're here today. I'm uh, glad to see uh, him and Christy. Uh, there was somebody else, Pat, that wanted to be here today and couldn't be here. And of course, I'm like, Sam, I can't think right now. Mother Jean Brown, good to see you uh, this morning. Praise God for your presence. Uh, at this time, uh, we want to honor God uh, with our gifts. Uh, each and every Sunday, uh, we, we certainly like to make the point um, that as God has blessed us, we in turn uh, want to be a blessing uh, not only to him, um, but to the kingdom of God. Realize that uh, the gifts you share each and every Sunday uh, helps carry on the, uh, the ministry. A lot of people, and I've seen this numerous times over the years, sometimes we take for granted uh, the tangible benefits of blessing. This uh, nice air conditioning you feeling right now, uh, that has to be paid for. Uh, these lights uh, that you are enjoying this morning has to be paid for. This sound system that uh, uh, Bryce and Henry put together each and every, it all has to be paid for. Even those nice bulletins that y'all get to read uh, and look over. See, I, I, got a, I got a whole folder now. I'm, I'm collecting bulletins. And, and I know it's kind of sentimental. Man, why are you keeping all that stuff? Well, because a couple years ago, we stopped doing bulletins over at Memorial. And being an old school Baptist like I am, man, I like the bulletin. I like going back, rereading notes and seeing little quips and points that people make out. The whole point is... God has blessed you. Now he simply asks what? To take a portion or a percentage of what he has blessed you with and give back to him. God, we thank you. We praise you.
for every blessing, for every benefit. We acknowledge and re-acknowledge that they all come from you. Thank you, God, for being so gracious, uh, so giving. We come to you this morning with the attitude of gratitude, and we place these gifts in your hand that you would multiply, sanctify, that they may go for the ongoing as well as for the upbuilding of thy kingdom. God, we have been reminded this morning that it's one thing to talk a good game and say we have faith. It's altogether a different thing for us to go out and to put our faith in action. So because, God, you've been so good to us, you've been so gracious to us, you've been so kind, God, we're going to not only give back, but then even after the benediction today, the remainder of this week, we're going to keep our spiritual antenna up. And we're going to look for opportunities to be a blessing to someone else. God, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we ask it all. All that agreed said amen. Thank you, Brother Henry. Remain standing for the benediction. Uh, again, we want to wish everyone a uh, blessed and safe uh, Memorial holiday. Uh, enjoy this time with uh, family, friends, and loved ones, and uh, continue to uh, thank God and uh, continue to ask God to assist you, to assist me, to assist us in being active participants and living our faith. Now, God, we thank you for every good and perfect gift because we realize they all come from you. Uh, we realize, God, as we leave this place, we never leave your presence. We never leave your care. Now, God, as we leave this place, uh, may the words of my mouth and the very meditation of our hearts, God, let them be acceptable in our sight. You are our strength. God knows you are our redeemer. We pray this prayer. We uh, share this benediction in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and soon coming King. All that agreed said amen and thank God. Everybody have a blessed week.